Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time, we started looking at the long-tailed pair, a circuit designed to deal with low-voltage, high-impedance signal sources. It was designed to subtract one input signal from another, so that common mode noise and interference, that is, signals appearing equally on both the input leads, would be suppressed, while differential mode signals, the result of the subtraction, would be amplified. We did this with a circuit consisting of two transistors, one connected as an emitter follower for one of the inputs, and the other connected as a grounded emitter amplifier amplifying the second signal, using the output of the first transistor rather than ground as its reference voltage. With the component values shown, the circuit achieved a differential gain of 30, and a common mode rejection of about 35 decibels. That's good enough to be interesting but not nearly good enough for the kind of weak signals and strong interference that we often need to deal with. So I ended the last episode with a promise to improve that common mode rejection. Let's have a look at how we can do that. Before we continue, I ask you to indulge me for a brief public service announcement. Your support for this channel has been really outstanding, and the channel has grown to where I'm seeing a small amount of revenue from YouTube. I love you all. You've been wonderful. And so I know you'll respond to the call to take care of one another that I put at the end of every video. I've decided that the whole of my January 2025 payment from YouTube will go to the Against Malaria Foundation. The Foundation's sole mission is to provide insecticidal nets to people living in places where malaria is endemic. Its performance is outstanding among the charities that I've examined in terms of lives saved per dollar spent to say nothing of the humanitarian and economic benefits of reducing disease burden in the tropical nations of the world. If you are inclined to fight bugs in more places than our circuits, I hope you'll join me in supporting this charity. There should be an affiliate link down there, or up there, or in any case somewhere nearby. Thank you so much for your generosity. And back to the video. We need to think about where the common mode rejection comes from. In the last episode, we derived equations for the differential gain and the common mode gain, and we defined the common mode rejection ratio as the ratio between them. Let's substitute the gain equations into the common mode rejection. I'll do that on Algebra Autopilot. The value of the collector resistor has cancelled out. We make the external emitter resistors as small as we can without making the circuit too temperature sensitive or destroying the linearity of its gain. We can't do anything about the intrinsic emitter resistance since it's determined by the quiescent current. So the only way we can get a better common road rejection is to use a bigger tail resistor. But we chose the tail resistor to deliver the desired quiescent current from the negative supply. How are we going to make that any bigger without messing up the quiescent point? We seem to be stuck. Unless we can come up with another way to deliver the quiescent current that has a high output impedance. Think about our previous episodes. Can you come up with a way to do that? We do know of several ways to get a fixed current at a very high output impedance. All of our transistor current sources have shown an output impedance limited only by the early effect. Even the simplest current source that we built way back in episode 2 had a dynamic output impedance of about a quarter megaohm, and several of the current mirrors that we built in episode 13 had output impedances so high that we couldn't measure them on the test rig we were using. So let's go back to our long-tailed pair and try replacing the tail resistor with a current source. Of course, we have to design that current source, so let's do that now. Because a current mirror has the highest output impedance of any of the current sources we've looked at, that's what we'll use. We'll start with the usual pair of transistors, with their bases wired together and the left-hand transistor connected as a diode. We'll want to have it pull half a milliamp into the output side, which means that we'll need to put the same current into the input side, we should be able to get that with a simple resistor. 
I'm not going to bother with a Wilson mirror just yet, since I'm guessing that I can get good enough stability just by adding a pair of emitter resistors. Those resistors, of course, go to the negative supply rail. At the intended current of half a milliamp, the intrinsic emitter resistance will be about 50 ohms. We will want the external emitter resistors to be several times that, so I'll make them 470 ohms. That means they're going to drop about a quarter of a volt. This is all real back-of-the-envelope stuff, by the way. The values aren't critical. We care that there's a constant current of about the right value, and that it'll be stable with changes of temperature and load. We care a lot less what the precise current is. Continuing with our back-of-the-envelope approach, we'll say that the bases of the transistors will be a diode drop above that voltage, and say that a diode drop is about three-quarters of a volt. That will put the bases about a volt above the negative supply rail. To get half a milliamp from an 11 volt difference, we'll need a 22K resistor. This subcircuit should be a workable current source. Let's try putting it on the breadboard. I've made the modifications here on the breadboard. I've pulled out the tail resistor and replaced it with the current mirror, built with another matched NPN pair. There's not much to say about it. So let's go ahead and test it. When I turn it on, the differential mode signal is just what I saw before. 300 millivolts peak to peak in yields about 9 volts peak to peak out. The gain of 30 matches our prediction. There's some common mode interference on the two inputs causing thickening of the traces. The differential output is scrubbing it away beautifully, leaving the output nice and clean. The gain is still about 30, as we predicted. What we see in the common mode signal is a much better story. I had to knock its amplitude up to 10 volts before I could even guesstimate the output amplitude. The scope is set to 10 millivolts per division, and I'm guessing an output amplitude of maybe 7 millivolts. It's hard to read because the scope is picking up an AM broadcast signal and various noise sources. I'll say that means we have a common mode gain of about 0.0007, quite an improvement to the 0.54 we had before. 93 decibels of common mode rejection rather than just 35. Cutting common mode signal back to 5 volts again and combining the two signals, I see a display like this. A beautifully clean 9 volt or so triangle output with no trace of the faster sine wave. There's a little bit of distortion, but it's coming from the transformer. Changing the frequency of the common mode signal doesn't change it. So we seem to have a terrific solution for our problem of common mode rejection. But I'm expecting to deal with really weak inputs, so I'd like to have more differential gain than the 30 from this stage. Can I pull that off? Well, let's review our assumptions. Why are we putting in the emitter resistors? We added them because when we were working with simple common emitter amplifiers like this one, we found that if the emitter resistor was too small, the small variations in the base emitter voltage drop as temperature changed were magnified by the circuit gain and made the biasing unstable. If we hit the output transistor with a little bit of warm air, the output voltage headed off to its negative limit and the signal clipped. If we applied a drop of free spray, the output voltage ran off in the opposite direction, and the gain fell off severely. In either case, the output was slow to return to the room temperature level. We concluded that the emitter resistor needed to be at least a few times the intrinsic emitter resistance, or else the amplifier couldn't tolerate temperature changes. But our differential amplifier is different from this circuit. If we remove the emitter resistors, the output transistor won't be looking at the power supply. Instead, it will be driven by a current source. The collector resistor should see nearly a constant current, so it should have nearly a constant voltage drop. The DC biasing ought to be stable. Even when we found a way to stabilize the DC bias, bypassing the emitter resistor in our amplifier made it change a triangle wave into a strange waveform like this with clipping on the negative side and gain reduction on the positive side. But that was for fairly large signals in. 
we're designing our differential amplifier to handle minuscule input signals. As long as we're handling only tiny signals, maybe we can get away with this sort of behavior. We can stay on a part of the arch shape that's nearly a straight line. Well, there's one way to find out. But before we jump into building this, let's try to calculate what we expect to see in the best case. Looking at our formula for the gain, and recalling that the emitter resistor was chosen to be three times the intrinsic emitter resistance, we expect the gain of our amplifier to increase by a factor of 4, from 30 to 120. Looking at the formula for common mode rejection, it should also increase by the same factor of 4, or about 12 decibels. The constant term is negligible. In the current mirror configuration, we had a common mode rejection of over 42,000, the one half in the formula is an insignificant drop in the bucket. This looks promising. Let's replace those emitter resistors with short circuits and see what happens. When I run this version of the circuit, giving it just the differential signal, our output signal is surely much bigger. It's clipping on both the positive and negative peaks. But the clipping is soft. We'll want to put a pin in that. Soft clipping can be a useful musical effect. We'll come back to this later. I'll dial back the amplitude of the input signal, and the distortion begins to resolve itself. There's one intermediate point where it starts looking like a sine wave. That could be useful, too. A little farther on, the signal starts looking like the gothic arch shape that we got when we made the emitter resistor too small on our common emitter amplifier, except that now the clipping is symmetrical. There's no hard clipping of the negative peaks. But we can cut it back even further, and get a pretty convincing triangle wave at a respectable output of 6 volts peak to peak. It's really hard to estimate the input amplitude in among all the noise. My best guess is that it's about 55 millivolts, which means our circuit's gain is about 110 or 41 decibels. That's within 10% or so of what we calculated. I'll take it. It's really striking how the noise that's polluting the inputs is cancelled out on the output. Getting that clean output waveform from the mess on the two inputs shows the power of a differential amplifier. Which from now on, I'll often call a diff amp for short, because engineers abbreviate things. The combined signals are equally impressive. I can't see the differential signal at all at the upper traces, but the circuit is pulling it right out. That's 5 volts of interference imposed on top of a 55 millivolt signal. Pretty impressive. When I input just the common mode signal, all that I can say is that I can't find it amidst all the noise in the output. The 5 volts has been cut down to at most a millivolt or two. At least 109 decibels of common mode rejection. We calculated that it should be about 105 decibels, and, well, this setup just doesn't have the noise performance to support that much dynamic range. I'll just say, it's better than I can measure. So this version of the circuit looks suitable for reasonable output levels. But did I lie about the thermal stability? We had better check. I'll hit the transistor pair with some warm air with my heat gun on its lowest temperature setting. The signal glitches a little, because there's a thermal gradient in the package between the two transistors, but it stabilizes almost immediately. I'll try the same thing with freeze spray, and see the same effect, that it glitches a little and stabilizes. Recall how our badly designed common emitter amplifier took many seconds to return to normal after it was heated or cooled. I'd say we don't have thermal issues with this circuit either. Now we have an amp with a common mode rejection of at least 100 decibels, and possibly a bit more. As long as we can hold on to that, it'll likely be good enough. A gain of 41 decibels, though, is probably not good enough for a preamp, so we'll need to boost the gain with additional stages. So that's what we'll do next time. Add a gain stage to this amplifier and see how good we can make it. If you want to see that, I understand there are ways of hinting that the YouTube algorithm ought to show it to you. Until next time, Stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!